Hello. In this video, I'm taking a look at the architectural style known as Queen Anne Revival, a definition that embraces an eclectic, informal, irregular style that emerges in the late 1860s. It was a reaction to both Gothic Revival architecture and the mundane utilitarian brick terraces appearing in Victorian towns. And while it doesn't have much to do with Queen Anne, it does draw on the grace and elegance of Dutch influenced designs that were fashionable in the late 17th and early 18th centuries. Drawing inspiration from the buildings of that period, but interpreted liberally with confidence and freedom. Below the roof line, designs are typically symmetrical in the classical style, but featuring projecting bay or oriel windows rather than the classical flat facade. Sash windows with small panes in the upper half were common, along with casement windows with leaded lights. Above the roof line, the profile is most usually irregular, typically characterised by gables, either straight or in the Flemish curved and pedimented style. Small dormer windows are a common feature, as are tall chimneys, and on grander buildings, the occasional turret or cupola. Architects working in this freestyle flexible mode include Norman Shaw and William Nesfield, the pair often collaborating in an informal partnership. The Queen Anne revival trend owes something to changes in society. A rising middle class of business people and professionals, proud of middle class Victorian values, philanthropy, thrift and hard work, enjoyed something of a golden age. And this increasingly democratically empowered and more socially secure generation, many of whom turned to non-conformity, wanted something rooted in tradition, but lighter and less formal than Gothic design with its sober overtones of high church Anglicanism. This painting from 1883, A Private View at the Royal Academy, is by William Powell Frith. The late Victorian and Edwardian period saw the emergence of suburban villas, individual, comfortable, practical middle-class homes for newly enfranchised and upwardly mobile families. At Cragside near Rothbury in Northumberland, a team including Norman Shaw developed the comforting, familiar features of a suburban villa in an eclectic architectural mix and match to create a grand country retreat, sitting in 1700 acres of woodland for Tyneside industrialist William Armstrong. Cragside's been in the care of the National Trust from 1977. Among the earliest examples of the Queen Anne Revival style are William Nesfield's Stowford and Magnolia Cottages at Weston near Crewe, completed in 1865. Also by Nesfield is Avenue Logic Kew Gardens from 1867. And here we can see that the steep pitched, typically hipped roof and tall chimney signature features of the Queen Anne Revival style are there from the beginning. Norman Shaw's Queen Anne Revival buildings include Lowther Lodge in Kensington, which has been home to the Royal Geographical Society since 1912. Asymmetrical in red brick with a steep pitched hipped roof, tall chimneys and Dutch gables. Also by Norman Shaw, the monumental Albert Hall Mansions in Kensington Gore and Grimm's Dyke in Harrow Weald, a house for the artist Frederick Goodall and later home to W.S. Gilbert, the Savoy Opera librettist. Both built in the 1870s, as was Old Swan House on Chelsea Embankment and here we have a dash of Art Nouveau added into the architectural mix. Shaw's Old Swan House is once more a family home after many years as headquarters of Securicor. In late career, Norman Shaw turned to classicism. His architectural heir, the man who picks up the baton of house designs that are traditionally inspired but freely and inventively interpreted, was Edwin Lutyens. And he will be my subject next time. If you've enjoyed this video, hit the like and subscribe buttons and click on the notification bell to be informed when the next video is available. Or you can subscribe by clicking on the rose window over my shoulder.